first to the stage. Does the mic work? Yeah. Ah, good, I can hear it. I want to thank, uh, once again, as others have done, uh, the, uh, the organizers for the opportunity to, to participate in what is an amazing festival. I want to thank, in particular, the audience that's assembled here, because you must be very, very interested in what I'm about to say. So uh, without further ado, let me try to justify that interest. When you look up at the sky, you see the stars. The stars seem not to uh, change at all. They seem to be ever fixed. But that's an illusion. As Sammy alluded to before, uh, indirectly, when talking about the sun, when you see the sun, it may seem fairly uh, benign and quiescent, but if you look at it in the x-ray, it's quite violent. There are uh, many, many explosions associated with it. Um, that should give you a hint of what stars are like in reality. If you speed up their evolution, you note, theoretically and observationally, that in fact stars are born, they live, and they die. The star uh, that we're familiar with, the sun, will die fairly quiescently and leave behind a white dwarf, which has an interesting second life, to be sure. But there are stars more massive than the sun, 10 times, 20 times more massive than the sun, that in fact will die quite violently. And they'll give birth to neutron stars and black holes, and they'll uh, launch what is known as a supernova explosion. And those supernova explosions can be seen across the universe. They're the origin of the elements of existence. The calcium in your bones, the iron in your hemoglobin, the oxygen that you breathe, they're all produced in this context, in the massive star context and in the violence of the explosion itself, to litter the interstellar medium and to contribute to the next generation of stars. So supernovae are central agents of change in the universe. In the galaxies that we saw yesterday in, in profusion, Every uh, region of those galaxies has this violence associated with it that gives birth to the new next generations, and part of the cycle of birth and, and rejuvenation in, in the universe. I'm going to talk about the theory of these uh, with a, a little bit on the observational side, and it's going to be a, a talk that is at the confluence of much of 20th century and 21st century physics, but also mathematics and the computational arts. And we're starting to glimpse at the, an understanding of exactly how these phenomena occur. And so, w without further ado again, I want to go forward and just list the basics of um, why you should be interested in supernovae in particular. As I say, they're the origin of the elements, but they inject energy into the interstellar medium. They, they roil and make it more turbulent, and so they're important agencies of the energetics of galaxies. They may actually trigger some star formation. The sun may have been triggered in, in its birth by a, a, a supernova. They're the major source or a major source of cosmic rays that are radiating you right now. High energy particles that are the back part of the background radiation of the cosmos. As we heard earlier in the week, um, supernovae can be used as cosmic yardsticks to take the measure of the universe. It's how we know how one of the ways, one of the major ways uh, that we know that the universe is not only expanding, but seems to be accelerating. And so they're very, very important. Uh, they have very important secondary uses. But they also, as I alluded to, uh, produce stellar corpses. Every star is going to have a final state. Neutron stars can be in binaries. They can accrete matter from companions and give you X-ray bursts and X-ray sources. Quite uh, exotic phenomena. Black holes, similarly. And so between white dwarfs, black holes, and neutron stars, we have a whole population of final states to uh, stellar evolution. But they have to be born in some processes. Now, these, this is uh, similar to what Sammy showed concerning the sun. On the right-hand side, you see the sun in the optical with sunspots, etc. And those sunspots uh, belie the violence that underlies them. But this is nothing compared to the energetics that I'm going to be talking about, the powers associated with supernovae and the gamma ray bursts that may be related. This is 22 orders of magnitude weaker than the supernova phenomenon. It, it completely dwarfs our own understanding. Any uh, things that we are associated with or understand from our uh, living on the Earth uh, is um, not equip us for understanding the magnitudes involved. And so the actors I want to introduce, then I'm going to talk about the players. The actors are massive stars that will die violently. 
They will produce neutron stars that may be only 10 kilometers in radius, but have a mass that may be 50% again as massive as the sun. So they're very, very dense. There are white dwarfs that are about the radius of the earth, but about the mass of the sun. Again, very dense, but not as dense as neutron stars. And of course, as Kip eloquently described, there are black holes in the universe. Those that I'm going to be talking about are stellar mass black holes, not the supermassive ones to which he alluded, but they're nevertheless uh, as exotic. There are many binary systems where you have close stars where the interaction between them is central to what you see. And so there are concepts such as accretion disks and bipolar jets, jets that can emanate from these very compact regions to give you phenomena that we associate with uh, gamma ray bursts. And so those are the basic actors. The players in the explosive as universe are, are listed here, and I've left out a few. There are X-ray bursts that happen on the surfaces of neutron stars, and there are thermonuclear explosions. But they're too small to be included in this talk. And Bob, I apologize, there are nova explosions that happen on the surfaces of white dwarfs. But they're also too small to be talked about in this talk. What I'm going to focus on are two types of supernovae and two types of gamma ray bursts. The first is so-called 1A supernova, which is very, very bright and is the major one used to take the measure of the universe. It's a thermonuclear explosion of a white dwarf that is replete with fuel. You take a white dwarf with carbon and oxygen, and you raise the temperatures by some means, and you can ignite a thermonuclear explosion, converting that carbon and oxygen into iron and many other species. This actually happens in the universe. It's a quite violent event, and it leaves nothing behind. Just the uh, products are uh, injected in the interstellar medium. The core collapse supernova uh, happens more than once a second in the universe. By the end of my talk, there will have been a number of thousands of these objects that will have exploded throughout the universe. Those do leave behind those remnants, and I, I mentioned them before, the neutron stars and the black holes. But there's a, quite a variety here. Gamma ray bursts are quite exotic. They were discovered in the mid-60s, um, they were published in the early 70s as existing, and they are of two types. One may be associated with this core collapse, but may be much more energetic and may be um, uh, the phenomenon that announces the birth of black holes in a quite exotic way, and, is associated, and they're associated with jets. The other may be associated with binary neutron stars, that are close enough that by the gravitational radiation to which Kip alluded earlier, um, ha can come together and merge quite violently. I'm going to show some of those, uh, some of the concepts a little bit later uh, associated with that. As when, when neutron stars merge, they give off the gravitational waves that uh, LIGO may be able to see. And so if we see a gamma ray burst at the same time as we see the gravitational radiation, we have the smoking gun for the phenomenon. That would be fabulous. So let me start with the 1As. And again, I'm going to be emphasizing the theoretical aspects, but there, are, there is beauty associated with these, and I'll touch on that. Just for people who want the science as well as the art, um, let me list a few of the basic facts. Um, you produce radioactive nickel in these contexts. Radioactive nickel is the progenitor to the iron that surrounds you. You produce nickel-56, then it decays into cobalt-56 and iron-56, the latter being the standard iron that you're familiar with. Because of that radioactivity, you heat the gas that is uh, uh, ejected, and it's that heating to incandescence that powers the light of many of the supernovae that we see. If we didn't have this nickel, particularly in the 1As, you would not see the supernova. So the radioactivity is central to the phenomena we associate with supernovae as uh, observers. The explosion might, uh, uh, the light might last for months. The amount of energy is incredible, and I don't want to even uh, dwell on that. I'll, I'll let you contemplate some of these numbers. And as I said before, it leads to the complete disassembly of the object. And this is uh, one of the outcomes. This is a supernova remnant. There's a blast wave here. It's about, it's a few light years across, in fact. And we see many of these in the galaxy and in the universe. Those are the products. And this is just the early phase, the first 10,000 years or so after the supernova. Um, and it's this material that is going to be incorporated in the next generation of stars. Um, they look fairly different, uh, but they're by and large 
uh, can be characterized by this blast wave that moves out with energies that are um, uh, 10 to the 28 megatons of TNT equivalent, if you can get your minds around that. Now, when we do simulations of uh, these phenomena, what we find is, in fact, that there is a burning front. It's almost like taking a piece of paper and lighting a fire on one end and watching the flame move through it. But that flame is a thermonuclear flame, so it's quite energetic. It's also the case that in a gravitational field, that flame, when propagating, leaves behind material that is a little bit less dense. The net result is that that flame is mixed. It's a turbulent thermonuclear flame. It's rather exotic as well. We're trying to simulate those sorts of things. So we have instability and a nuclear phenomena simultaneously. And we try to throw this on a computer, and we get things like this, where instead of a nice spherical expansion, we see turbulent bubbles. Each one of those bubbles is actually, again, burning the thermonuclear fuel, the carbon and the oxygen, into iron and nickel, etc. And so the theorists have tried to simulate this, where, in fact, the thermonuclear burning front might be only a few millimeters in thickness, but the star in which this is happening may be a few thousand kilometers in radius. So you can imagine it's a very difficult computational problem to handle that range of scales. And so they punt. They try to do what they can. And in the process of doing what they can, they find structures like this when they look on the small. The burning fronts can get quite corrugated, quite um, uh, tangled, and it's very difficult to simulate. On the large, this is what people see, where you see a white dwarf disassembling into bubbles, etc. And this is just the early phases. And I'll call your attention to that clock. That clock is moving in milliseconds. And so what's happening is that a star the size of the Earth, by thermonuclear processes, disassembles within seconds to inaugurate the supernova that lasts for months that you can see for 10,000 years that affects its environment for millions of years and the next generations. And this happens again and again and again. Now, there are a variety of mechanisms that people have suggested, all of which are thermonuclear in a white dwarf. One of them is an off-center ignition, where this is the white dwarf star, and you just set off a little bomb in the center because you want to see something happen. And you see how it propagates. And you can see that it rises like a balloon. It penetrates to the surface and starts to spread, all the while burning this thermonuclear fuel, incinerating the star. In this particular case, what happened was it wrapped itself around the star before the entire star disassembled. And at the back end, it clapped. This, the burning material hit other burning material so violently that it inaugurated an explosion on the inside. So you have a bubble rising, surface wave going over to the backside, and then a violent initiation of the explosive detonation of the entire object, all in a second. The speeds we're talking about are 10,000 kilometers per second. Escape velocity from the Earth is 1,000 times less than that. The amazing thing about what I'm saying is a lot of what I'm saying is actually true. I won't, I'll leave it to you to distinguish. The other, types of sup the other type of supernova, the, by far the most prominent, is th that associated with the death of massive stars, so-called core collapse supernovae. Again, there are some facts associated with them that are very similar to the, for the 1As, but you do leave behind a remnant, mostly a neutron star, but at times a black hole. And we'd like to know when the black hole is formed and when the neutron star is formed. We, there are still things we don't understand. They're, they're the major sources of elements again, but one of the things that's quite fascinating, certainly to me and to many of the theorists, is that what's happening in this case is it's not thermonuclear. It's associated with the collapse of the core that, because it doesn't have thermonuclear fuel, isn't allowed to thermonuclearly explode. It continues a collapse to all the way to nuclear densities. And so the basic scenario is the following. 
A massive star has been evolving for 10 million years. It creates a core in its center, a very dense core. It's a white dwarf-like object. That white dwarf achieves the so-called Chandrasekhar mass, above which it can uh, support itself against gravity, and it collapses. If it were made of thermonuclear fuel, that collapse, just like a diesel engine, would heat, it, heat up that material, and it would explode. But without thermonuclear fuel, it continues to collapse, and that collapse takes a second, just as in the other case. So imagine the drama. A star has been around for 10 million years. It creates a core in the center that when it becomes critical, collapses in a second, sets off a supernova. The whole object is dying in one second. It'll set out a blast wave through the star that will take a, 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 an hour to a day to get to the surface. Then it'll go through the entire display of a supernova, partially uh, powered by nickel, throwing away all this material in a quite violent event. The progenitors of these sorts of things might look like this. This is Eta Carina in our own galaxy. It may be a binary ma of massive stars, and it has this nice bipolar structure. It hasn't exploded, but it erupted in 1843. People would like to think that maybe this is a precursor of a supernova only about 7,000 light years away. That's a small distance for these things. You don't want to be too close. The evolution of these things can follow something like this, like the HR diagram, luminosity versus surface temperature that Garrick showed yesterday. High luminosities, high temperatures on the left-hand side. The star might be sitting here, and the star, like the progenitor for the supernova 1987A that exploded in 1987, about uh, 8,800 uh, 8, days ago, would have evolved like this. It would have been a blue jo uh, object. It would have expanded to, to the red, then go to the blue. There are various interesting things like when this happened, fire and tool making was, uh, was occurring on the Earth, and uh, here's a Homo erectus emerges, etc. But um, that's the, we can say uh, with, with reasonable certainty that the evolution of such objects follows something like this. And then it'll end up either as a blue supergiant or a red supergiant, and then the outer material will evolve independently of that central core. That central core is where the action is. The rest of the star is oblivious that it's going to die. And when it does, it explodes. Here's luminosity versus time, and here's in days. This is just an example. A blast wave propagates through the star, it hits the surface, and you get this big flash, and then you get this light curve that can last for very many months. A supernova, when it goes off, can be as bright or nearly as bright as the entire galaxy in which it resides. This is just an example of one. Before, there was no light there. Now there is. This is just an example. An example of a supernova remnant created in a core collapse supernova is given here. This is Cassé. It, it went off less than 400 years ago in our galaxy. It has many, many structures in it. The blast wave here, a so-called reverse shock here. One of the things that's rather interesting about, about this thing is that, in fact, the elements that are created and have been ejected are ejected aspherically. They're not distributed very uniformly. Another thing that's interesting is you see that little dot at the center? That's the newly born neutron star. And we see it in the x-ray. Now, I said that the elements that are ejected are not ejected spherically. This is an example. These are, this is a rendition of the data that people have taken of Cas A, where the green is iron that people have seen, and the red is argon. And you can, we could have done this for a number of different elements. But you can see that there are structures that are emerging that are quite aspherical. That is a theme in all these things. Explosive phenomena tend to be very, not only violent, but unstable. And material is broken up. And so you have to be able to, in order to simulate these things theoretically, do things beyond the one-dimensional problem of the spherical explosion and, and really bite the bullet and go into the three dimensions. One of the things that's produced, of course, in an explosion, that, a core collapse supernova explosion, is a pulsar. You have a rapidly rotating 
neutron star that has a magnetic field that is giving off radio waves, can give off x-rays, optical. This is a picture of the crab in the central region, and you see a pulsation associated with this. This is, in, this is not in real time. This is pulsating at 30 times a second. It's associated with the rotation period of this one and a half or so solar mass object. So these things can rotate very fast. If the Earth were rotating this fast, it would spin itself apart. Now that supernova 1987A, when it went off, it not only excited supernovae, but it excited its supernova community, but it excited its environment. This is the supernova. This is a time-lapse picture from a Hubble Space Telescope. It'll repeat. You can see the inner region. I want to call your attention to two things. One, it's not spherical in the inner region. That stuff is just being ejected. Two, you see all these things lit up. That's the material that's going fastest from the blast, and it's hitting this ring that resided around the supernova and exciting it to fluorescence. We're still watching this, and we're going to be watching this for the next 50 years. It's one of the best examples of a core collapse supernova that we've been able to study. It's the first supernova to go off since in our vicinity that we noticed since the invention of the telescope. In our vicinity is the crucial part. We see 500, 600 supernovae a year, observers, and there's more than one a second, as I said, in the universe. So let me get to the theoretical crux. So here we have a cartoon of a massive star. What happens at the end of its life is it creates a so-called onion skin structure, where you have nested elements that are progressively lighter as you move out and heavier as you move in, hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to neon and other species, to oxygen, to silicon, to iron. That iron core is the so-called Chandrasekhar mass uh, when, it, uh, when it gets massive enough. And it has a radius, again, just a little bit smaller than the radius of the Earth. When it reaches that mass, it collapses catastrophically. This whole object ca collapses within about a quarter of a second. People who know how long a golf ball is in contact with a golf club when you hit it, it's only 10 milliseconds. A few times that is all we have for this entire object to, to collapse and to form the proto-neutron star that will give uh, birth to the neutron star. So when we do these simulations in two dimensions, we, do a we watch the collapse. There is the bounce and there's a shock wave that's produced. The sh behind the shock wave, there are instabilities. The radius here is only about 200 kilometers. So this is the belly of the beast, the inside of, where all the action is happening. And you see instabilities of plenty are happening. But notice something. That shock wave is not moving out. Theorists have yet to figure out how it actually explodes. When you do these simulations in two dimensions, you most of the time get that the shock just sort of sits there. That's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. That's not a supernova. And so we've been spending the last few decades trying to figure out how to reignite this object because we can't figure out what we're doing wrong. Now, we let some of these calculations even in, in axial symmetry, in two dimensions, so we're not doing the full 2D, 3D problem, run for a long time. And you see the shock wave at the periphery. It's still a radius that's only a few hundred kilometers. It's trying to explode. But it's being held back by all the material that's raining in. There's a tamp, a fist, holding it in. In this particular simulation, though, we let it go long enough that the inner oscillations were sufficient to generate sound waves aplenty. And those sound waves steepened into shock waves, and it ignited the supernova. When it ignited the supernova, it was off-center. And it left behind a very uh, uh, rapidly oscillating object. I'll repeat this just to give you a sense of what the state of the art was just a few years ago. I don't believe that this is the way things happen. And the reason I don't believe it, the major reason, is that we can now do 3D simulations. These things are expensive, and so we have to do it in stages. And with the 3D simulations, we see something else. Well, this is pretty exotic, and I made a movie of it, so I thought I'd show it. Now, remember what I said, that that shock wave seems to stall. In doing 3D simulations, you can try to get a sense of what's happening. Those, 
Those ghost-like particles that are flying in are just represent the mass that's falling in. That's the accretion. It's holding in the blast, and that blast wave is sitting there uh, trying to get out. Can't. But you see it's oscillating in all sorts of ways. This particular simulation just shows quite graphically the basics of that phase. But what do you think is going to happen if you do a calculation that takes longer than this? This is a preliminary calculation, which we'll repeat. And this shows you the three-dimensional character of what we're dealing with. This is just a, a surface that is going at 5,000 kilometers per second. Everything inside is going slower, and everything outside is going faster. And you see how broken up that material is. It's a rather amazing context in which to try to do theory. But this is what we have to contend with. When we put in more physics, this is what we see. It collapses, it bounces, and very soon you get this turbulent convection. This turbulence is similar to the turbulence in the 1A context, or the thermonuclear case. It's associated with the so-called Rayleigh-Taylor instability. The Rayleigh-Taylor instability is what happens when you mix salad dressing. Anybody ever done that? You have oil on the top and vinegar on the bottom. There's an interface. When you change the direction of gravity, it turns out that there's a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid, and nature tells you it's an unstable surface. It's also the reason water falls out of a glass. Anybody ever wonder why water falls out of a glass? No. If you have a pump, a pump can support 10 meters of water. There are lots of pumps on this island. They can pull up 10 meters of water because of atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is holding up 10 meters of water. If the glass is only this high, that's much less than 10 meters. So atmospheric pressure should be able to hold in that water. It has more than enough pressure force to hold in that water, but the water falls out. It's because the interface is unstable to the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. If there's any corrugation at the surface at all, that heavy water fluid on top of the light air fluid will be, uh, have an unstable interface, and that will fall. So try it sometime. Put a piece of paper there, thin piece of paper, you stabilize the instability. And the water won't fall out, but if it does, don't blame me. But I would recommend people try this out. So you get structures like this. These structures are not only complicated, but they're beautiful. I find them so. And it's this type of an object that is emerging into the rest of the star. So you can do the same sorts of things. I have a few movies like this, where you see the characteristic structures of the roiling and boiling material. The shock wave is right out here. And in this particular simulation, the explosion occurred fairly early. When we did this simulation in 2D, it did not explode. We're getting a hint that dimension, perversely, is central to the mechanism of the explosion. Nature does this effortlessly. We require the Department of Energy and their computers. This is the type of structure you get. And because I like this, I'm going to show another one. The surface, again, is a near the shock wave. It's bubbling and boiling seems to be essential to the explosion. So one of the things that seems to be happening here is in fact the following. When you get to these high densities and temperatures, you produce neutrinos in abundance. Very, high, uh, very weakly interacting particles, but at these densities and temperatures, they're produced in abundance. And in this phenomenon, you get a big burst of neutrinos. Kip was boasting that they get 10,000 times the luminosity of the universe in gravitational waves. I can't trump that. But I can get a factor of five times the luminosity of the universe in neutrinos in this context. Neutrinos are easier to see. They're still tough. And so you get structures like this. And so what are we concluding? Those neutrinos not only take out energy, but they can heat up the material behind the shock. And what seems to be happening is that the efficiency of the neutrino matter coupling, the neutrinos coming out there, um, is larger in 2D than in 1D. And it's larger in 3D than in 2D. And it seems to be large enough in 3D to give us what we've seen 
since the Chinese were taking records. The camera is rotating here. The blast wave is emerging. And what's left behind in the dissolve is a neutron star. But the structures are complicated. So those two types of supernovae have engaged astronomers for, for many, many uh, decades. But there are these new objects, gamma ray bursts, that I want to end with. One class may be associated with the massive stars, as I said. In both cases, there seems to be a relativistic jet. You have material, maybe a, a few hundredths of a solar mass, maybe more, that is moving relativistically, very close to the speed of light, probably in both directions, emanating from a central object. How does that happen? There may be two ways that people have, two ways that I, that I think that I, I want to uh, talk about today. In both cases, it may be that a black hole is formed. The gamma ray burst emits mostly gamma rays. The average gamma ray burst lasts for 10 seconds, but there's some that are shorter, some that are longer. That burst is, more, is brighter than a supernova in gamma rays, but it has about the same total energy, kinetic energy, radiation, etc. Cartoon, you recognize the onion skin structure, but in some contexts, you may form a rapidly rotating black hole that can produce a jet. We can simulate things like this, and this is just a, a, an analogy where these are magnetic field lines. If you have rapid rotation, you can wind up the field lines and you can amplify them. There are different ways of doing that. We can make movies of these results, and so we take a few field lines, just watch what happens. Remember that collapse and that bounce and the shock wave? in this more exotic context, spinning up the magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields in the process become amplified. They amplify to such a degree that the magnetic stress is sufficient to blast in, in a bipolar fashion an explosion out the, uh, out the poles. It creates, in some sense, a tunnel boring machine in two directions. But very energetic, they can be maybe 10 times as energetic as a regular supernova. That's moving 20,000 kilometers per second, by the way. So these types of jets that can be produced in principle can then emanate, uh, uh, propagate through the star that's, uh, that's sitting there. It may take only 10 seconds for that jet to emerge after being produced in a, a process similar to what I showed earlier. I'll show this once again. When it emerges, and there's probably another one on the other side, the gamma ray burst phenomenon starts, but it seems like there's something very interesting here. The jets have to be pointing towards us in order to see them. You can see a little bit if they're pointing off to the side, but the average gamma ray burst seems to have to point towards us to within five degrees or so in order to actually see, to be able to see. One of the reasons for that is that a relativistic jet beams its energy forward by Einstein's theory, if it's moving very fast, very close to the speed of light, then it'll beam its radiation, its energy forward. That's where the brightest spots are. So that's the most likely region in that direction where you're going to see this. One could do other simulations of rapid rotation, and you can get all sorts of exotica. I'm not going to emphasize the little points, but this is just an interesting simulation. And you can see the types of jets that might emerge. Now, this is uh, what I found off the internet, so I apologize for that. But this is what happened when those jets emerge, eating away at the star, pointing in one particular direction and the opposite direction, leaving behind perhaps a black hole with an accretion disk that might continue to power it. But the only reason you see this thing, except for the underlying supernova that might be associated with it, is because the beam may be pointing towards you. And if it is, and it's in our galaxy, it will be a very bad day. The, anything in its way, that, those distances is going to be sterilized. The Earth would be killed. 
Fortunately, these things happen maybe once every million years in our galaxy, maybe once every 10,000 years. Now, there's a satellite in space, a Swiss satellite, that can trigger on gamma ray bursts and then tell people on the ground to go look at them. This is just an artist's rendering of what it does. It sends telemetry down to telescopes that will then slew to the gamma ray bursts. And what they saw was not just gamma rays, but infrared and optical emission. Those gamma ray bursts interacted with their environment and produced very bright signals, so-called afterglows. And those afterglows can be seen, the brightest, can be seen across the universe. In fact, gamma ray bursts, because of their brightness in the gamma ray, and perhaps because of their afterglows, may be the best or a, one of the most unique probes of the farthest reaches of the universe, at so-called redshifts of maybe 10 or 15, if they exist. Maybe the probes of the first stars. The other type of gamma ray burst with which I'd like to close may have a, a very different origin, but always associated with these violent events, maybe the neutron stars and black holes, very rapid, highly energetic phenomena. And that could be what I alluded to before, two neutron stars that are so close that by gravitational radiation they spiral in together. Well, what happens when neutron stars collide? We don't really know. But it can't be good. But what we think might happen would be the formation of these relativistic jets. So people have done some simulations of these collisions. This is similar to something that Kipps showed, where you have the tidal effects that can interact, throw off material. And these simulations can give us a sense of what's happening. And notice the time scale. That all happened in 10 milliseconds. And other people have simulated these things as well. The neutron stars are completely destroyed. They merge into something that's rapidly rotating. That object, when it loses its rotation, is too massive to be a neutron star and collapses to a black hole. During this process, you have a huge amount of energy available. You can generate very large magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields may actually be instrumental in producing a jet. This is a, a storyboard of a simulation just like that, those two neutron stars, but now with magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields, in principle, can be wound up, and you, they started to see what the makings of a jet. At the same time this is happening, as I said earlier, gra gravitational waves are being emitted. They're characteristic of this phenomenon. If you see the gravitational waves at the same time as you see the gamma ray burst, this will be a very important event. We will have, under, we will have been able to predict something and then verify something after a lot of study that we could only have hinted at many years ago. And we'll have understood the character of gamma ray bursts. This is my last cheesy movie. And I I'm showing it for another reason. You see these neutron stars that are uh, merging, getting faster and faster as they come together. Then a miracle happens, and you get this burst. Now that burst lasted only maybe half a second to a second. It's a so-called short, hard gamma ray burst. These two together give us some of the most violent events in the universe, and we're starting, in fact, to be able to simulate these things. So let me summarize with what I think are the most important and salient points. What we're dealing with are stars that do have a birth, a life, and a death. They evolve. Stars of different types evolve differently. Sometimes when they die, they die quite violently, but in the process give birth to the next generation of stars, produce the elements of existence, and enrich the galaxy with what we need to survive on Earth, for example. The mechanisms of supernovae and gamma ray bursts we're starting to understand. It requires the computational arts. We have a yardstick for the, universe, uh, for the universe to try to measure it, and we'll hear more about that from Joe Sill's talk. We give birth to some of the most exotic objects. But to me, what is one of the most interesting things is that over the decades, people have been able to figure out a complicated story, a scenario, a general set of ideas that may well be true about the fundamental phenomena in the universe. And it's only possible 
in the modern era because we're at the confluence of great progress in physics, in chemistry, in mathematics, in computation. And that has given us the capability to, in our minds and with our computers, relive and figure out the great dramas of the universe that involve not only violence, but regeneration. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Mr. Burroughs. Now we have time for a little few questions. Any question? Uh, the issue of how supernovae are powered has been around since I was a graduate student, a half a century ago. And uh, you and others have been struggling with it for decades. Uh, are you telling me that you now believe you know the answer, that it really is uh, due to the neutrinos carrying the energy out and, and reigniting the explosion? As Kipwell knows, uh, the subject is, has been rife with uh, false claims and uh, false starts. So one has to be a little bit careful about claiming victory and that one has identified robustly the mechanism. However, there's every indication that the neutrino powering should work. We can see it working in a subset of massive stars, the lowest mass massive stars from a neutrino-driven wind that every simulator is getting. It's under-energetic, but we have a spectrum of supernova energies, and those may just be the weakest ones. What has been missing in the past is access to multidimensional codes and compu uh, computers that can uh, actually uh, employ these codes profitably. And so what we've seen is as we've gone up in dimension, that things get, are getting easier. I'm hoping we don't have to go to four dimensions to prove this. But what seems to be the case is that it's much more efficient in three dimensions. And so I would bet, and I'd be willing to take that bet, that in fact we're on the cusp of understanding. The limit is computational power, which is which is a frustrating thing. I'm, I, I like to do things in the back of the envelope. I need a really big envelope for this particular problem. But it seems as though three dimensions may be the key, and the neutrino driving may be central, as people thought for a long time, but we're never able to demonstrate. We have our work cut out for us, but the goal is to find out what the origin of the elements are, the origin of neutron stars and their velocities, the spectrum of supernova energies, um, exactly what the mechanisms are, and, and try to explain those wonderful phenomena that we see in the night sky. Any other question? Thank you. Um, what do you think about quark-gluon stars? Do you think they can be formed in explosions like that? Well, it's... We don't know the equation of state of neutron star matter very well. We think we know it adequately well to make the statements I made to Kip. However, I could be wrong. If it's the case that there is a phase transition from that very dense neutron star matter to quark matter at sufficiently low densities, which is the key, then it's possible, if it's a so-called first order phase transition, to actually get another bounce, another um, source of energy, and to ignite a supernova that way. My own feeling is that that's rather artificial, that the equation of state is not going to be such that you'll get the phase transition at a low enough density. You'll get the phase transition um, at maybe just very high densities uh, for the more massive neutron stars, um, and it'll be too little too late. So my feeling is that, though it's a very interesting idea, that it may not really obtain. Yeah, last question. Thank you. Uh, since the first stars that formed were unlike the stars that we find around us today, would the supernovae in those stars be significantly different from the ones we see around us now? I, I think so. Uh, what David is alluding to in particular is that 
when the first stars form, they don't have the benefit of all those heavy elements that came from the supernovae, chicken and egg. The first stars that form may be significantly more massive than the average massive star that is associated with the core collapse supernova. And if it's hundreds of solar masses, then the mechanism is indeed different. It may be easier for those to explode because you can, through theoretical means, determine that in fact that you can produce a lot of oxygen in the interior, that the collapse could be very violent, you get a very strong thermonuclear explosion. Rotation may be important as well. People haven't had as much trouble exploding those objects. And they will produce heavy elements that will then uh, contaminate the uh, environment in which the next generations will form. So I think the first generation may well be different, as you suggest, and that the mechanisms for those won't involve the Chandrasekhar mass, won't involve the scenario that I describe, but maybe uh, involve uh, simpler physics and maybe easier to obtain. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Burroughs.